Hey everybody, it's Dr. David, the ENT doctor. I am putting this up because I wanted to cover the two most common questions that I get asked and my thoughts on what I think the right answer to those questions are. So, question number one. My child has an airway problem. Are they too young to get it fixed? And the sub sort of version of that is, can I wait for a while to see if they outgrow it? So when we look at uh, a problem, the best time to fix it is there and then. Anything that you let go has the potential to get worse over time and leave more of a mark. Now, what do we know about children? Well, when it comes to children and airway obstruction, what we know is that the younger they are when it first becomes a problem and the longer that it goes for, the worse they are down the track. And while some people uh, might uh, advise you uh, that they may outgrow it, when we look at the science and the research to clarify whether, first of all, if that happens, and secondly, if it does, does it leave any consequences behind, the answers are relatively straightforward. So do some kids outgrow airway obstruction? The answer is yeah, they do. There is a period of time where uh, in the mainstay, it's tonsil and adenoid problems. Uh, there's other things that can cause it, but let's talk big picture. Uh, tonsils and adenoids have grown too big for the child and causing obstruction. And if we wait, that child's otherwise uh, growth patterns might then kick in and play catch up and then outgrow the tonsils and the adenoids. Now, when we look at the numbers, we think that possibly happens in around half the cases when it comes to children with obstructive sleep apnea, and that's based on sleep study uh, results, uh, in particular from a study called the CHAT study, which was the Childhood Adolescent um, Tonsillectomy Study. And what we need to be very careful about when we look at that is when they promoted the fact that waiting six months led to a resolution of sleep study findings, when they actually looked at the child, in other words, not the numbers on a piece of paper, but the actual patient, those children who were enrolled in the, we found a problem and we're gonna fix it now, versus the, we found a problem and we're gonna give them six months, and compared the children that were fixed to the children that subsequently developed a normal sleep study result, the children that were fixed we're better off. So the airway obstruction as measured by a sleep study got better. So on paper, their numbers were better, but in reality, those children didn't do as well as kids that actually got fixed. So there's a couple of reasons why that comes into play. And one of them is relying on sleep studies. And I'm not being disparaging with respect to the, the, the results and so forth of these tests but we need to be mindful of what it is that we're measuring versus what it is that we should be looking for versus then what do we do about certain results. Now, when it comes to sleep studies across the board, the first thing we know is there's this thing called a first night effect. What that means is that for a lot of people, adults and kids alike, when they have a sleep study, um, it's a disruptive process, it's not comfortable, it may not be done at home, it, not the bed, you're lying in a, a normal position, you've got all these hooks and things wired up to you. Um, that's not normal. And we know then that that causes a disrupted sleep in a good number of people. And if we then allow the people to go and have it done again the next night, they actually have a better night's sleep with regards to bordering on, on normal as best one can be. And in 40% of the time in adults and kids alike actually have a completely different result. So that's one reason why we need to be very careful about sleep studies is that uh, in the situation where they did a sleep study in kids and then six months later they did another one, if the result just in the same kid could be 40% different from one night to the next, just purely based on the study result, which one do you believe? And are things actually getting better in terms of their breathing and sleep is getting better? If that was the case, these kids should be functioning better, but they weren't. So my first answer is that 
when you find a problem, you fix it. And then who fixes it? Now, this is the big one that, again, uh, raises its head. And I'm just being truthful. I'm just doing what I do. And that can make what I do seem like it's mainstream, where in actual fact, if you jump around the uh, social media spaces that are out there and look for the um, airway ENT doctors, there's a few, but I put a lot of effort into making sure that my journey with respect to my learning and my education, which is forever ongoing and forever developing, is shared with you all. You, you can look back at the page and see a multitude of posts. And there are the memes, uh, little short segments and statements. There are the videos and there are the papers. And those papers just keep rolling. And it's not just the papers that keep rolling, it's me that keeps rolling too. I, looking back at what I've done, for example, let's talk about tonsil surgery. Now, when I did my ENT training, learning to be the ENT surgeon, I learned three different ways of doing tonsil surgery um, and saw several other ways of doing tonsil surgery as well. Then I went and did my pediatric uh, ENT training and came across two other ways of doing tonsil surgery. And what I then did is I took one of the ways that I learned in my pediatric training and blended it with another way that I learned as part of my ENT training to have a very unique approach to tonsil surgery compared to what I'd been taught. And that has served me very well. But guess what? About two years ago, I changed again. I found a better way. Uh, a way that uh, reduced, for example, the operative time. Now, it's no good being fast uh, if it's not safe, and it's totally safe. That's a very important principle. But when it comes to children and the research that bounces around about exposure to anaesthetics, uh, in the hands of a paediatric ENT surgeon uh, like myself doing a, a prolific number of uh, airway-related operations to help children breathe and sleep better. Um, I think, in, unless there's a somewhat untoward reason, uh, you should competently be able to perform that procedure uh, of tonsil uh, removal in a child uh, in less than 10 to 15 minutes. And I say that uh, because I'm not including things like adenoid surgery or turbinate surgery or septum surgery, just purely the tonsil element because I've, I've seen people take an hour and, to do the same operation. And that's not a criticism, it's an observation. And I think that's not where we need to be when it comes to caring for children. So again, who do I recommend? Well, again, I'm not in a position to be able to recommend people, and I certainly won't disparage people either. But I think we need, need to sort of just take a step back and realise that I, I'm not everywhere and I don't know what other people do in different parts of the world, let alone even just in different parts of Australia, let alone um, just down the road for, you know, 100 kilometres down the road as to what people do. I think it really is a starting point for a conversation with regards to the information that I share here that uh, people can reflect upon and utilise and find their own pathway to uh, someone that they are happy with, especially if it comes, of course, to your child, because you need to feel that that person is akin to, if you were gonna ask them to drive your child to school uh, in a car, you'd wanna make sure that they are a good driver. No parent would, would think otherwise. Uh, and again, you have the opportunity to have those meetings and have those discussions with your preferred local provider. Uh, and at times, if for whatever reason, there is a want or need to travel elsewhere, that, 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 that's not unusual either, especially in Australia and other parts of the world. And I'm very blessed that people have got to know me 
uh, at a professional level such that they do recommend uh, people travel uh, from quite sizable distances at times to see me. And I never take any of that for granted. In fact, I, I don't take any of this for granted. Uh, the mere fact that I keep doing this and striving is a reflection of the fact that my desire to get more knowledge and share more knowledge is, is completely uh, welded together to the way that I want to keep developing as a professional. I want to keep striving, keep developing my skills, my knowledge to increase my abilities uh, in my particular area of interest. And, and that is upper airway obstruction, both in adults and children. I do see both. But in, in particular, I do see a lot of children. And as I said, a lot of it is about adenoids and tonsils, but that really is being overtaken substantially now by nasal obstruction uh, with regards to a structure called the turbinate, and in, to be pedantic, the inferior turbinate, uh, which is a structure that sits inside the nasal passage coming off the side wall. Uh, and if it uh, increases in size to the point that it touches the middle part of the nose, which is known as the septum, well, we've got a real blockage going on there. And when I look back at what I was doing 15 years ago with regards to turbinate surgery, and I, I basically have, well, not basically, I only have three turbinate operations that I've maintained um, from the multitude that are out there. One is nasal cautery. Now, when I look 15 years ago, nasal cautery is something that I was doing sometimes in kids, possibly under the age of six. The nasal cautery is, is quite simply a burn. And the purpose of that is to cause a bit of scar tissue formation, which then contracts and pulls the turbinate into a smaller uh, size. But I've known for a long time that it is a temporary uh, event with regards to how things can play out. And in those cases that fail, and, and failure is, is, is a possibility, it usually happens within six to 12 months. So 15 years ago, kids under about the age of, let's say six, maybe, you know, turbinate cautery was needed now and then, knowing that it would possibly fail, but then they'd be a bit older and a bit bigger and get on to uh, other things. So what are those other things? Well, my go-to for kids 15 years ago between the ages of six and 12 was something called radiofrequency ablation. And that's purely a, think of it like a melting technique, where instead of burning the tissue and causing scar tissue formation, using a low level uh, thermal uh, ablation technique, essentially melting some of the tissue away. And that does pretty good and would last about two years and again, after two years where we start to see the failures is around about then, uh, on average. And that's okay. Then they would sort of be old enough and big enough that I would start doing what I call the adult operation. Uh, and the adult operation I would, 15 years ago, probably 12 and over, would be to use what's called a microdebrider, which is an instrument that spins around rapidly, is attached to suction, has a little channel that opens and closes as it spins and has a very sharp blade. And in, in simple terms, um, in that slight moment of time when the gate opens and the suction draws a bit of tissue in, it spins around and amputates that tissue. And it does that 5,000 times a minute. So it's a pretty effective tool. And 15 years ago, that was kids uh, that I was doing back then, uh, around uh, 12 and over. Where am I now? Now I very, very hardly ever do cautery. Uh, it, it really is just the size of the child dynamic. And uh, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, they're, they're on the, the cautery spectrum just purely because there isn't much room in there to actually get in there with other instruments. Radio frequency. So that used to be six to 12. Where is it now? Well, now it's two to probably around about eight. Um, so I've really paired that back. And what about microdebrider? I would never 15 years ago have ever thought I was going to say what I'm about to say. I've had to do microdebrider, so adult surgery, 
in children as young as three to open up their nasal passages and get them breathing again. And there's a, something remarkable has happened over the past 15 years that has seen this shift in terms of the, both the frequency of turbinate surgery and also the level of invasiveness that such surgery has required for me to feel like I am doing the right thing to help these children breathe. And that's uh, maybe a unique experience. Maybe others don't um, have uh, such experiences. I can only reflect on what I see and what I do. And I even recall um, doing a, a talk with an allergy doctor uh, way back around about 10 years ago, where a question from the audience was, well, what do you do about hay fever in one-year-olds? And we both said, it's probably not hay fever in one-year-olds. It's what we call allergic rhinitis. You need to look for other things. Well, I eat my words now. Uh, I, I am seeing this in younger and younger cohorts. And as I said, in, in far more severe forms with regards to obstruction. So I feel, you know, as I said, uh, I need to progress and evolve. There's no point in me sitting still in the one spot, just keep doing the same thing I was doing 15 years ago. Because I know if I was, I'd be doing a huge disservice to those children that I do see and, and do help breathe and sleep better. So just to recap, um, in terms of when should you get something fixed? Well, as soon as it's a problem. And, you know, for example, if you had a tap that was leaking in the house, well, you'd want that fixed pretty quick. And who do you get to help fix things? Well, you have to go with your gut. You have to go with the feedback and thoughts of others. And then you have to just weigh up what it is that you're seeking and wanting. And that's where, when it comes to the care of your child, I would think that experience has to count for a substantial amount of the consideration that you put into in terms of wanting to seek out um, the, the, the care options that are there. Cheers.